Someone has said that leaders aren't necessarily born, they're made. And one of the ways they're made is by following a great example. The Bible presents us with a great example of leadership, and that's who I want to talk about now as we look into the book of Nehemiah. I consider Nehemiah to be the greatest leader described in the Bible apart from Jesus himself. Now you might think, hang on a minute, <laughs> there's some pretty good leaders in the Old Covenant, which is where we're sort of grounding this in. And that's true. We have several prophets who I consider to be great leaders, Jeremiah in particular. We have kings such as David, who are exceptional leaders. But Nehemiah faced challenges that these people didn't face. And even despite the overwhelming odds against him succeeding, he managed to. And he did that through leadership skill. So let me introduce you to this man who, as I've already said in our previous video, his book, this book, Nehemiah, was originally the second volume of the book of Ezra. There's a high probability that Ezra had a hand, or at least a follower of Ezra, had a hand in putting this book together. We see in here there's a, a complete section from the book of Ezra repeated in this book, word for word. And we can see that it focuses on events that happened when Nehemiah says, I wasn't even there. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a great, great, great probability that Ezra also had a hand in telling us about this man, Nehemiah. And so we open up in verse 1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now, it happened on the month of Kislev in the 20th year. I was in Susa, the citadel. So what we're immediately introduced to is Nehemiah, during the time when the Jews had been allowed to return from exile, he's still in Persia. Not only is he in Persia, he's working for the Persian emperor. So with that in mind, we, we continue on where he says that when he was there, that Han and I, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had returned survived the exile, is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed. Now this is great writing. For we, we in just a few sentences now have a broad sweep of what's happened and what is happening and it sets up this book. And Nehemiah's main role in this story is exactly around that verse. The walls of Jerusalem have been destroyed. We're, we're told that Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king. That's in the last verse of chapter 1, in verse 11. It's the last statement. And that puts a dramatic twist on this, a dramatic turn of events. This is not just anyone. This is someone who not only has access to the king, he's the man who presents the king with his wine. That makes him an incredibly trusted official in the king's service. So we see that Nehemiah does something incredibly uh, risky. And we're, we're told this, that no one can come into the king's presence being sullen or uh, upset or sad at all. So we, we read that he, um, when the king said, what's the matter? <laughs> Nehemiah does this thing where he just, he prayed. He just, it says in chapter 2, verse 4, Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Now we're already introduced to Nehemiah straight after the opening verses that set the whole scene for the whole book, that he then turns his face toward God. He prays and he pours out his heart to God. And we'll see this. One of the themes through the book of Nehemiah is his prayer his prayer life, his prayer to God is a continual theme. And this is a great clue as to why he was such a great leader. So he requests of the king certain provisions. The king perhaps is a little bit surprised that he hasn't requested more. 
what we see as we go through the book as he arrives in Jerusalem to help oversee the rebuilding of the wall project is that he is immediately confronted with these three characters. We read in chapter 2 verse 9, Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. And what we see here is immediately confronted with opposition. And we see from this that great leaders always have to deal with opposition. In fact, one of the things that I think catches young or inexperienced leaders off guard is, is that they get opposition and it's incomprehensible to them. But this is one of the, the certain clues that makes a great leader. A great leader is someone who is able to deal with opposition. So with that in mind, we see that Nehemiah would not be dissuaded by, at this point, these two characters, Sam Ballot and Tobiah. But what he does is he, he does a great leadership thing. He goes and he surveys the, the wall, the very things that he's going to rebuild. He wants to figure out what are his resources? What does he need to do in order to do this? The result was, that he comes away realising this is not going to be a simple or easy task. We, we read in chapter 3 that he begins to break down this mammoth task into what we might call bite-sized pieces. And these bite-sized pieces are then assigned to different families who are living within the city walls, which are lying in rubble and ruins. And so what he's done is he's essentially given each of these families what we might sort of calculate to be a roundabout, take some of the rubble and just rebuild 10 metres of the wall. I'm not asked, you know, there, there, were, there would have been kilometres of wall to uh, finally rebuild, but he's asked the families, just give me 10 metres. And this is a great leadership principle that Nehemiah is demonstrating that in order to get a great task, a big task, a mammoth task, an epic task completed, figure out how you can share the load. Break it down. And that is exactly what he's done. So we see in chapter 3 that he's assigned the tasks. And no surprise, we come to chapter 4 where it says, Now when Sam Ballot heard we were rebuilding the wall or building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. And he jeered at the Jews. So you may be a leader. You may have a task that you want to do. You may want to lead others in helping to see that task, that mission fulfilled. Notice this. The enemy, the enemy, our spiritual enemy, the our enemy will often bring great discouragement in the process. But great leaders know where their encouragement comes from. This is one of the I think one of the, the most profound thoughts any leader can have when they know God, and it's this. Your audience is an audience of one. There will be people that will not understand what you're doing, why you're doing it. People who perhaps don't know the Lord, and, and especially our spiritual enemy. He knows that what you're doing, if it's in obedience to God, is going to cause his domain, great injury. And here we have Sanballat and Tobiah, these two, are going to bring tremendous discouragement to Nehemiah. But he doesn't buckle. He keeps going. And an interesting thing is that they actually appeal to uh, the king, the, the, the government of the day, that this thing was an unlawful activity. And Nehemiah does something interesting. He's confident that it's not. And so he doesn't allow himself to get too distracted in this process as well. Many leaders are easily distracted, but Nehemiah wasn't. And so we see that Nehemiah, once he's rebuilt the walls, he's able to turn his attention to the more pressing matters. The wall was a big task, but there was something even greater task, and that was the people's reinstituting of 
the covenant. That is their, their original agreement to serve and follow God. And so in chapter 5, we see that one of those things that the people had not done was how they treated the poor among them. And we see that they were being charged exorbitant interest rates on money that had been loaned to them. The law of the covenant specifically said, don't do that. So we see that Nehemiah, in order to set a, an example, and this is another great leadership trait we see in, in chapter 5, it says, verse 14, Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them their daily ration, 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of the Lord. And this is a great leadership principle. I know that in pastoring, and now I'm coming up to my 29th year of pastoring just this church, that there have been times when people have not understood. They've not understood why I have done something or have not done something. But I know to the best of my ability, I've tried to serve the Lord. I've tried to do what God has told me to do. And with that comes a great confidence that ultimately God will vindicate. God will uh, silence those who are perhaps protesting or appealing against you and that God himself will, will take care of that. And that's Nehemiah's confidence as well. We see here that in, uh, I mentioned that there's a portion of the book of Ezra that is repeated in Nehemiah. And that's what we see in chapter 7 down from about verse 5 through to verse 70. It's, it's a, almost a, an exact repeat of Ezra chapter 2. And then we, we have Ezra introduced, which is one of the reasons why I say I think this book was either compiled by Ezra or a student of Ezra. And so we have Ezra appearing in this story. And he's the priest. He comes and he's, we, we've already read in Ezra that he came to teach the law to the people. And this is what he's done. The, the wall's been rebuilt. This is a huge thing. For decades and decades, as they'd been in that city, they had not had that, that wall restored. And now Nehemiah, under his God-appointed and gifted leadership, was able to get the job done. And Ezra tells them in one of the most, uh, one of the <laughs> verses that's taken out of context more often more than any other. It says in Nehemiah 8 verse 10, then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. What a profound thought. And we have here the, uh, an amazing account under the leadership of Ezra that he encourages the people to renew the covenant. To do that, they have a time of confession where they stand and it says in Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 3, And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord, their God, for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worshipped the Lord, their God. An important, a, a vitally important part of leadership, godly leadership in particular, is the ability to remind people, to remind people about the Word of God, to remind people about their obedience to the Word of God. And so, especially in this context, we see that the people of Judah have returned from Persia, and th th there'd be a generation that had very little idea of what Jerusalem was, what it once was, what the law of God, how significantly it played in the life of the city, and so now we see in Nehemiah chapter 9 a retelling of their history. This is such an important thing. And one of the things that we see here is, is covenant language is repeated over and over in verse 8, uh, where there's the retelling of the history. You found his heart, that's Abraham's heart, 
faithful before you and made with him the covenant to give to his offspring the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite and the Girgashite. And you have kept your promise for you are righteous. And the implication as we'll see is, God, you've been faithful, but we haven't. We haven't kept the covenant. It's rules, verse 13, it's true laws, it's good statutes and it's commandments. And so this is such an important thing that we see in Nehemiah. Not only had he done the practical, the rebuilding of the wall, he had set an example of what a leadership who, was, who, who would be someone not open to being corrupted, either through discouragement or through taking more than he could have, and he didn't. And so now we have the stage set for his return. And one of the things that we see is when he comes back to Jerusalem, we see that the people have realized we've come back, but our exile is not over. And so we read in chapter 9, verse 36, Behold, we are slaves this day in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. Behold, we are slaves, and its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies, over our livestock, as they please. We are in great distress. Because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. And we see in chapter 10 a renewal of the covenant with God. All the things, the commandments, the rules, the statutes written in the law. And so we then have the, the return essentially of, of Nehemiah where he comes back and he realizes despite all the good work that Ezra and the priests have done, there's still something wrong. There's still people here who are bringing in practices of the foreign, uh, foreign nations. And, and Nehemiah is, is pointing out, this is the very reason we were sent into exile. Because we had abandoned our co the covenant with God, where we had pledged to him that we wouldn't do this. And it was the foreign wives of King Solomon, they say, that had brought about the, the very cause, the ultimate, the ultimate cause of the exile itself. Because for generations after, after Solomon, we, we, we just completely abandoned the covenant. So we read in chapter 11 and verse 3, As soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. Verse 6, while this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem, Nehemiah says. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king, and after some time I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem. And then I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah. And we have the corruption of the priesthood. And so Nehemiah is is outraged about this. And so he, he takes some pretty drastic measures as a leader. Now, this, this tells us something about, again, good leadership. He had to confront this evil. He had to. He had to deal with this corruption, and he did. And so he then says down at verse 14, Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I've done for the house of my God and for his service. And again, down at verse 22 then i commanded the levites that they should purify themselves and come and guard the gates to keep the sabbath day holy remember this also in my favor O my god and spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast love and what we see in the retelling of the history of israel how often in nehemiah the mercy of god is stressed it almost sounds like we're reading something out of the new covenant where we know God is revealed as a God of love, mercy, and forgiveness. And so Nehemiah has brought the people to a physical renewal. The city was renewed physically. The, the temple had begun to be rebuilt. The altar was established. The walls were rebuilt. And he wanted to oversee the, the, the role of the priests to bring about a renewal of the covenant and, and for the people to return to that covenant. 
There are some great lessons to be learned here from Nehemiah, and I hope that you'll spend some time reading through this book and discover those lessons for your own life, your own marriage, your own family, and even your career. So with that, I would just ask that you join with me in our next installment as we look at the book of Esther, the last of the historic books in the post-exilic period. And then we're going to look at the prophets, what they had to say. And so with that, would you please give this a like if you haven't done so already. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And would you give it a thumbs up so that not only are you liking it, but, but hit the notification bell. And I'd love to hear what you have to say. If these videos are at all a blessing to you or helping you, if you have a question, if there's something I've said that you're not quite sure about, leave it in the comment section. I try to engage with most of the comments if I can. And I really look forward to going through this series, which for me is very, very precious because what Nehemiah did set the stage for the coming of the Messiah. And that's where we're going in having a look at this as we finish up with Esther in the historic section and then go into the, what the prophets had to say. And I hope to see you then in our next installment in the post-exilic biblical literature.